All right, cool. I do want to try to get on and cover one more section uh, before we close out for today. So I'll try to see if I can maybe go through this fairly quick. This is the third chapter. So we had before that it was the, which tribe was it? The Kwaza, right? Uh, the, yeah, the Kuza uh, was the tribe that took control of Mecca. And how do we get from them to Quraysh and then eventually to our own prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Well, <clears throat> let's first look at this ayat al Quran. This is from Surah Hujarat, ayah 13. This one, Rahman Rahim. O mankind, truly, we have created you from a male and a female. We made you peoples and tribes that you may come to know one another. Surely the most noble of you before God are the most reverent of you. Truly, God is knowing aware. So there are two classifications here of people. Uh, the peoples and tribes. Uh, in Arabic, that's the Ashawuban Wakabila, if I remember correctly how to pronounce it. Um, so uh, when I was listening to the lecture on this from Sheikh Hamza, he points out here that this is an important distinction, kind of going back to what we were talking about before in terms of the different types of Arabs. This is differentiating a little bit broader into different types of people in general for the entire planet. Most of the people we have today would fall into the first category of the Shuobin, uh, sh uh, sh yeah, Shuobin, uh, peoples. These are loosely affiliated people. They usually have not a father uh, or an ancestor as their commonality. Instead, it's more groupthink, uh, possibly, or language-based. So, um, and a lot of people, an example, particularly here in the West, in America, we don't necessarily know who our ancestors are in our genealogy. Maybe we can trace them back maybe two, 300 years, but generally not much further than that without doing like a DNA test. Uh, and even there, we don't know the exact names. We, we've lost that. It's not of our own ancestry, right? That chain. Um, and that, that largely comes, surprise, surprise, through not following the divine laws of God, the Sharia. Uh, and uh, so this is a common thing that will become more widespread as times come towards uh, the end. And the other types of peoples are the tribes, the Kabila. Uh, and this is like a huge family unit. And this is what the Arabian Peninsula was like. We still have some elements of this today in some of the Bedouin. Uh, most uh, Arabs who are city dwellers will probably have lost and turned more into peoples, sadly, as opposed to uh, Kabila, but we still do have some remnants of these uh, in, uh, in the deserts, uh, perhaps throughout Northern Africa, and then some other cultures around the world as well who are more remote uh, may still actually operate under more of a tribal base as opposed to uh, the, the people-based uh, types of affiliations and groups of people. So this is an important thing to note because what we're talking about here is tribes. And this is the kind of more recommended way. And what we'll notice is that when the Quran comes and when revelation comes, Allah is correcting all of this. So we will find that eventually what Allah's revelation is, and we, we all know this now, is that the nations and peoples are best. What does what the, the ayah here say at the end? Surely the most noble before God are the reverent. So it's our piety, our taqwa, that actually is what matters. And so all of us who are Muslim, we are all brothers and sisters in a broader tribe of the deen of Islam. And that is what unites us. And it's a beautiful thing because, for example, if you travel from maybe say uh, America to Malaysia, you can walk into a masjid and when the Akama the Adan comes, you'll be there praying with brothers who you may not even know the same languages, but you're united in the Salah. And this is a very beautiful thing. Alhamdulillah. All right. So um, hopefully you guys can all see this. Um, this is a genealogy. Lings puts this out. It is in the back of the book on one of the last pages. 
So use this as a reference and a guide because this is how um, this this will kind of be the shortcut to the, some of the names. Uh, Links has highlighted the most important ones here for us, and I think referencing back to it is going to be extremely beneficial for our understanding of the genealogy and who these peoples are because this is one huge big tribe. I mean, we're looking at the um, uh, Koza at first, and then the Kresh are the ones who marry into it, basically. So if you go up here all the way to the top, you have the first person of Kresh. He's actually, Kresh was his nickname. Um, and we don't know necessarily what that means. Um, it, 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 it technically, if I remember correctly, means like to bite. And so it, it, it might be that maybe he bit something when he was a kid and he got named Kresh as a diminutive, uh, as, a, as a joke, and it just stuck with him. Um, I think if I remember, Shekhamza says that uh, it also could be related to shark possibly. So perhaps he was in his uh, temperament uh, likened to a shark. Um, Allahu alam. We don't know uh, how he got the name. His, his, his actual name was uh, Fikr, um, and Kresh was just a nickname. And so that's where the tribe of Quraysh comes from. Um, Kusay is the one that is of importance to us because Kusay marries into the Kuzaa. So um, as we read in Lings, Hulayl, he's one of the main chiefs. He's the Sayyid uh, in a way, uh, the chieftain, uh, the lord uh, of uh, Mecca at the time. He's uh, the head chief of the Kuzaa. And Kusay marries Huleil's daughter. So Kusay there, if you look in the chart, he's in the dead center. He's the one who marries into the rites and stuff of Mecca. And Huleil, um, he, he likes Kusay, his, his son-in-law, better than his own sons. And so when he dies, he passes on the rites of caring for the pilgrims to Kosei. And so the Quraysh and the tribe of Quraysh are the ones that take control of it. And if you look back, just, just point out a few things. Um, so Kosei is the, what would it be? The great, great grandson of Quraysh, a figure known as Quraysh. And Alharith is one of the sons. And Alharith has the clan of uh, Ubeda that comes from him. Um, the other son has the clan of Kab and uh, Amr. Um, that's the clan of the Suhail. We have Suhailis that still exist today uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, in Saudi and in Yemen, and I think in Oman as well. There are Suhailis. Uh, that's that's a Quraysh, an ancient Quraysh tribe. So they are related distantly to the Prophet. Uh, so on of Kab, we have the uh, Husays. Uh, which comes uh, Amr, that's the clan of the Amr, uh, uh, Amr, Amr ibn uh, uh, al-As, he's from that clan. Uh, and then uh, there's also the, uh, the Juma clan, uh, the, which is uh, Uthman uh, and uh, uh, Uthman uh, bin uh, Mazum comes from this clan. Th these are companions of the prophet later. So just, just highlights here to note, um, Kab also has Adi uh, as a son, and that's the clan of Omar later. So this is another relative of the prophet. It, the beauty here is to note how all of these alliances form and that they're all in a way distant cousins and distant relatives. They're, they're related and they're coming together because of the tribal bonds that are unique to this type of society. Alhamdulillah. So Mora has some more sons. He has Kalib, Taim, and uh, Yak, uh, Yakazid, Yakaza. Yakaza here is the important one because he has the Makzum. This becomes the most powerful tribe. Um, so even though um, Kusei is the one who ends up getting the responsibility the Makzum are the most powerful. They're the wealthiest. They have the most kind of political authority in Mecca um, at the time. So um, that's important to notice. And their uh, descendants of that 
you may be familiar with um, Khalid ibn al-Walid, the, the famous uh, companion who was a champion of the battlefield. Uh, so he's a descendant of the Moksumi clan. Uh, Taim, this is the Taimis, you know, Abu Bakr Taimi. Abu Bakr is from this family, this clan, uh, as well as others. And so Kalab's the father of Kosei. Kosei is the one who marries in the to the uh, Kuza'a uh, and gets the rights. His brother, uh, Zuhra, is the descendant that eventually comes down to the prophet's mother, Amina. Um, so when we have others, the prophet's cousins, Sa'ad, uh, Abrahman, Auf, uh, and, and others. So Kosei, Kosei has kids, of course. And this is important. So his first is uh, Abdadar. Uh, and this is the clan of Musab later. Very important. Um, this is the one who would be the heir of taking over the rights of the pilgrims at, at the Kaaba and the keys of the Kaaba and all of this. Um, however, he's not a very not very good. No one necessarily likes him. Um, Abdul Manaf is the son who is the best. Uh, and then there's other sons as well, uh, Abd and uh, Abd uh, Uzza. Uh, and Abd Uzza is important because the clan of Assad comes from him. And this is the clan where Khadijah, uh, Waraka, uh, Zubair, uh, and um, others uh, also come from this clan. It's very important. So um, when Kusay dies, he does give the keys of the Kaaba, and the rights of all that to Abdadar, his firstborn. And uh, Abdul Manaf, although he's the, the better of them, uh, out of honor and respect, um, let's that be, his son is becoming quite well known at this time. And his son is Hashem. And Hashem soon becomes the Sayyid of the Arabs, the, the master uh, by default, just because he is so... Uh, uh, su such a good leader. And um, <clears throat> when Abdadar is the one who uh, who has the control when, when he's passing and it's to go on, well, there becomes kind of this debate among the Arabs of Mecca as to who is going to take control of uh, the these rights. And Hashem gets supported by the brothers of Suher and Taim, uh, and the Makzum, the, the, the most powerful tribe, they keep in support of Abdadar. And so this is um, where we start with the Beni Hashim. So this is the sons of Hashim, who are now kind of going into battle. Um, so yes, it was severed. He was the, the Sayyid of his time. And so here's the sons and they're supporting. And what happens is they create oaths of union. So there's two different packs that are formed, the scented ones. Uh, these are the ones who are coming around to support um, Hashem. And they go to the Kaaba, they dip their hands in perfume, touch the black stone, and they swear an oath among each other to say that we are the ones who are going to support each other even to the death. The others also make something, and they're, they're, they end up being called the Confederates uh, in the, the tradition. And those are the sons of Abdadar who are supported by the Makzum. What eventually happens, since they can't battle this out, Mecca is a sacred city, they have to make some kind of compromise. So they decide that the Confederates will retain the keys. Uh, this is the sons of Abdadar. They, they retain the keys to the Mecca, uh, sorry, the keys to the Kaaba and running of the assembly. And then the sons of Hashem, uh, the Bani Hashem will then take the responsibility of taxing the dwellers there and providing food and drink for the pilgrims. So this becomes the compromise. And what's important about this is that these kind of clan rivalries will resume and are important during the life of the prophet. And they will resume after the time of the prophet as well in Islamic kind of political history, in a way. So this is important to learn these right now. 
And so the last thing that we want to look at is that Hashem is the one who establishes the great caravan journeys, the winter journey to, um, see, it's the winter to Yemen, and then the, the summer one is to uh, the Sham, Upper Levantine area. And so this is this is very important because you guys may remember we have a surah about this, right? Surah Quraysh. For the uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. For the secure passage of the Quraysh, their secure passage and the journey of winter and of summer. So let them worship the Lord of this house who relieved them of hunger and made them safe from fear. This is a very beautiful surah. And this is, in a way, um, giving tribute to the uh, rights of Kaaba uh, and of Mecca, the sacredness of the place, and those who are there, and of many Hashem as well. Uh, who Hashem, of course, being the one who established this. And that is just, if you just go back here, where we're looking at Hashem's the great grandfather of the Prophet, alayhi salatu So this is, this is not too long before the Prophet when all of these things are starting to finally fall into place. SubhanAllah. And so back to our map, we have the, just, just to kind of look, the, the lines along this map are the trade routes. Uh, that were known at the time. And so you have right, routes going down into Yemen. You have routes going up towards Iraq, uh, towards the Gulf, uh, and towards, um, uh, of course, uh, Palestine and Syria, Levant, and region Shem. So this is important because all of them pass through what city? Mecca. So this was very important. And of course, as it had been for quite a while, these trace routes weren't necessarily something new. This is just formalizing them into a particular seasons for it, which is important. Alhamdulillah. And so lastly, and I think we'll probably end here for today. Um, the son of Hashem was with Talib Abdumanaf, right? That's what we had from our genealogy. Yeah. Abd <clears throat> Abdul Manaf. Um, actually, wait. So this is, this is actually something that can be a little confusing. So Abu. All right, let me go back <laughs> for those of you who didn't didn't read. So so Hashem, he he's on these these travels. And one of the cities, if you look at the map here, you've got Yathrib, which later becomes Medina on the map. Yathrib is the old name for Medina. And Yathrib was originally a Jewish city. So the Jews, after the Romans had kind of wiped them out and destroyed them from uh, Palestine, uh, they had migrated away and fled into the desert. And Medina was one of the places, uh, Yathrib, uh, sorry, Yathrib, before it becomes Medina, uh, Yathrib was one of the cities that they had established. And some of the Arabs from Yemen on their journeys had decided to reside there with them. There were two tribes that were the most common. Those were the Aus and the, um, what's the other one? Aus and the Hazraj. Yeah, the Aus and the Hazraj. And the, this is fascinating. So in Judaism, Jews are a matriarchal society. In Orthodox Judaism, it's matriarchal. So it's the mothers, the women who are actually in charge. And you'll we'll notice this later in the story, that how important women become, uh, particularly when Islam comes into the city. Um, so there is a particularly very important and influential woman, Salma, of the Najr clan. And she's from the... Uh, the tribe of the uh, Khazraj. Hashem takes her as his wife and she agrees to marry under conditions that she stays in Yathrib because she was influential, powerful, probably had business there that she ran, uh, possible political power she had there as well. They have a son together who stays there as well and lives in Yathrib. His name was Sheba. And Sheba stays there. He grows up. And eventually, Hashem dies. He dies on the trade routes, actually in Gaza. So 
what happens? In Mecca, they need a new leader. They need someone who's going to take over the rights of doing the provision of food and the rights of caring for the pilgrims with food and water. Abu Shams, Hashem's older brother, he's busy. He's trade, tied up with trade in Iraq and Shem. So he's not there in Mecca. And Nawafel, he's actually the half-brother. He's busy down in Yemen. So Al-Mutalib, the younger brother of Hashem, he, he is by default kind of the chosen one. And he recognizes, hey, look, my sons aren't that great. We need someone who's going to be the heir of Hashem. And who's going to take over the tribe of Bani Hashem, as the say of the Arabs for this. And so, Mutalib, he goes to Yathrib to meet with Salma. And <clears throat> he convinces her to let him take Hashem's son, Shaiba, as his heir to bring him down to Mecca. Because Mecca is more of the geopolitical regional area. Um, he's, he's do, Shaiba is doing well as a son. He, he's, he's leading in Yathrib, but Yathrib is a second city compared to Mecca. And in fact, Taif, a sister city to, to Mecca, may actually have even been more important than uh, Yathrib at the time, too. So um, Salma agrees, and moving of Shaiba, uh, his, his uncle, Mutalib, taking him. To, to Mecca is going to be an important thing. So yeah, Sheba uh, is taken from Yathrib to be the heir of Harith, which he soon becomes. And this is this is a cool story here. Upon entry, they're, they're riding their camels into Mecca and all of the, the, the relatives from Mecca come out to, to meet Mutalib and say, who, who is this slave that you have? Who's this new slave on the, the camel next to you? And so Sheba then thereafter becomes known as Abd al-Muttalib, which is the grandfather, of course, of the prophet, Abd al-Muttalib. That was originally Sheba, the son of Hashem. Uh, and Abd al-Muttalib, obviously Abd, we know, is the servant of the, the slave of, generally referred to Allah, uh, Abdullah. And, and, and beauty is it that later Abd al-Muttalib, Sheba, has a son whom he calls Abd Allah as well, who we'll look at, I think, next week. <laughs>